And so today we are going to be walking through some of the use cases for ontologies and knowledge graphs, specifically focusing on things that you can do with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So let's go check that out. All right, so knowledge graphs and ontologies, you may think that they are one and the same thing. They are not. We're going to start out with the framework, which is an ontology. It gives your knowledge graph the rules and regulations on how it should use your vocabulary and your own logic for internal systems. Also, if you want to get a hold of me, you can reach me at my email address. I'm very much active on LinkedIn, and I also have an educational YouTube channel if you want to go and check out more on these topics. All right, so let's start with some terminology first. So semantics, it's the meaning of a word, a phrase, or a sentence. It's, it's the context that you are going to be trying to represent for machines to utilize. That's where the frameworks come into place. They add context for the machine to understand what you're talking about. And also not forgetting about the people, because at the end of the day, whatever you do, it's a person at the end that is going to be using whatever you are doing. So the semantic web is how you make those connections. How do you make connections between different topics so that you can make them smarter? And then machine learning, AI, and neural networks. I have a whole bunch of things online to describe what those are, but in a sense, we are just going to be talking about how do you train automation to understand the contextual information that we have in our vocabularies. So why are we doing this? Innovation. So a lot of us have started with the LCSH. A lot of those are not, they are people readable, but they're not really machine readable. So you can see here, dog, dash, dash, food, dash, dash, recipes. Somebody wouldn't use that in a typical search. They would search for recipes for dog food. Uh, so what we're trying to do is take those very traditional library centric subject headings and morph them into something that is more machine readable and quite honestly, more people readable as well. It's really going to help make your search better in whatever systems that you are working with. Modern search engines don't do well with the dash dashes and the, the pre-coordination of, of subjects. They are much better at keywords. Now, obviously we want more structure than just a typical keyword, so that's not going away. This is just adding more natural language thinking behind what we are doing with our subject headings. So let's start with ontologies. Where do these fall in the other vocabulary structures? These are the structures. The terminology you're actually working with, like the previous slide mentioned, needs to be more natural language rather than um, the put it on the side of a book in the stacks method that the LCSH traditionally uses. Uh, but Ultimately, it's the structure on how you put these things together that actually matters. And it's not one or the other. Taxonomies and their relationships build out into thesauri and their relationships. And from thesauri, it builds out to ontologies. And from ontologies, it builds out to knowledge graph. So it's not necessarily you're doing something wrong. It's just where in the evolution do you want to find yourself? So looking at this, you can see that the research on thesauri and taxonomies is, is down in the last four to five years. And the reason for that is not necessarily that they're going away or they're less important. It just means that they are more stable. A lot of people have accepted them. There are a lot of standards out there on them. But when you start to get into things like ontologies and knowledge graphs, those are more often things that are cutting edge, people are still trying to figure them out. There's not a ton of standards around them, but they are very useful, especially for machine learning. And that's why you see a lot of the research on those topics. So this is a very busy slide. Don't worry, you can get all of these slides either on LinkedIn, I have this posted on my LinkedIn, or you can reach out to me directly. And this is really just talking about the interoperability. So we've already talked about how taxonomies are sort of tried and true and how we're starting to get into more graph-like structures with those ontologies. So the way that that works is you have to map things together in a different way. The SARI and taxonomies are very hierarchical, whereas an ontology and a knowledge graph are more web-like. So here you can see in the middle of all of these different types of frameworks that are 
graph-like in structure. Crosswalks, we are all very familiar with that, and the switch or hub model, also known as a knowledge graph or an ontology, are some of the ones that have the most application. Those are all on the left here. And these really talk about what are the things that are the most important to us as librarians and people in the information space. So this slide is really just showing how crosswalks and switch hub models are really the best for the return on your investment. But let's go to the next slide to see which one might be best for you. So when you're actually doing a mapping, again, one subject to one subject, you can use a crosswalk structure. There's nothing wrong with that. The thing is, once you get past, you know, three or four different vocabularies or three or four different data sources, even if they're internal, that's where a crosswalk really falls short, mostly because it's very difficult to do a one-to-one -one mapping for that amount of vocabularies. So the knowledge graph structure, the ontology structure, is making sure that you don't have to map all of those different terms together you can just map them to one centralized node and then that node or concept can be then mapped to other nodes and concepts. So all the synonyms, all that richness of variety that we get in subjects, they can all be mapped to one concept. And then all you have to do is make sure that you map that one concept to other concepts in an easy to understand fashion. So a hub-like structure allows you to add all of that richness of other subject vocabularies or other synonyms or other ways of describing, even in other languages, the concept or the subject that you are looking at. Once you have that all mapped together, that's the red dot in this hub structure, then you can use an ontology to describe how it relates to other red dots or concepts in the vocabularies that you're looking at. And that is what is called a triple. So here are some examples. So you can see that identity protection is an element of cybersecurity. John C. Doe is the co-author with Sam B. Smith. Boeing is a manufacturer. So these are called triple structures. So a common question that I get for those that are not as familiar with ontologies is, where do these relationships come from? So when you are creating an ontology, you can use some of the more standardized types of relationships. Is a, has a, part of. Um, there are a lot of ontologies out there that you can use, some that are on BioPortal. There are other standards out there like FIBO is one commonly used in finance. Schema.org is another one that is used for e-commerce and websites in general. These do come with preloaded relationships. The thing is, you can make them up. And so you might think that's not... That doesn't sound very good, Ashley. Why would I want to make something up? So these are primarily to fit your use case. It is defining what these lines actually mean. And really those have to be customized to your use case. If you go and look at Wikidata, for instance, you can actually see the different types of relationships that you can find. Capital city, monarch of, it, there are some out there that you can go and check out a really great resource to see what kind of schema uh, elements are out there for you to use if you're not very familiar with the different standards. It's called Linked Open Vocabulary. And if you go there, you can just type in director and it will find all of the different schemas that you can uh, use to describe a director. So if you are not familiar with ontology standards, if you feel like you're out of your element at this point, don't feel bad at all. The reason that you want to use an ontology is so that you can build in all of those, those rules for your knowledge graph or your machine learning to take advantage of. And if you don't know exactly where to start, I would strongly recommend going and looking at BioPortal. It's free. It's very easy to use and understand. You can go check out other videos on my channel where I go through some of these. Start with something that's already out there that's very close to your use case. And that gives you a template to look at as you go through this experience. Because ultimately, machine learning is there to help you to make things 
more intuitive and more interesting and connecting things that are similar to how we commonly think about how things are connected together. And this is where machine learning starts to come into play. If you are teaching the machine that John C. Doe is an author, then you can also make sure that the rules are in place where authors can be co-authors of other people. So if the machine understands that two authors are on one article, it will understand that that might mean that they are co-authors of one another. So how does machine learning work? If you teach the machine that, and you would do that using triples in a knowledge graph structure, there is a tool called Protege that helps you with this quite a bit. Also, another one on the market is called Graph.O, I believe, Graph.O. And that one is from data.world. Both of them allow you for free to start to model how these things relate to each other. So I was talking about how it can infer things based on what you teach it. Here is a basic example. We teach the machine that Garfield is something called a cat. Then we teach the machine that cats have tails. So if you infer with machine learning, it can understand that anytime it sees something labeled as a cat, that it will have a tail. Because in this example, it knows that Garfield is a cat, it will know that Garfield therefore has a tail. But you have to be careful because not all rules are universal. So if penguins are birds and birds can fly, does that mean penguins can fly? Well, it also depends on how you define flying in your vocabulary, because if it is a matter of flapping wings and moving with those, those wings, then penguins are flying just underwater. So it really depends on how you are describing things. And that's why no matter what you are doing with your vocabularies, you have to make sure that you are paying attention to the rules that you are teaching it because not all of them are universal and they also have to really make sure to fit the needs of your use case. All right, so if I gave this image to the machine, would it understand where the oranges are? And the answer is no, because unless you've trained models, on what all of the other elements are in this image, it's not going to understand what an orange is. Machines are not smart. The smartest machine on the planet, and that's a pretty smart quantum machine, is as smart as a four-year-old. Now, that's pretty smart. And by the way, adult cats are about as smart as a four-year-old. So imagine lots of cats running around making decisions for you. It's not a happy thought. So you do have to make sure that whatever you are doing with a machine, that you really, really understand what it is doing. You have to make sure that the model is doing what you are expecting. And you also have to make sure that it understands enough to be able to do the task that you are giving it. Machine learning is very sophisticated, but at the end of the day, it is automating what humans would able, be able to do themselves with a lot of time. So if I was teaching a four-year-old, everything that's in this image, that's essentially how you would teach a machine as well. So I would have, what is wine? What is room temperature? Because there's no condensation on this bottle. What does condensation mean? What is a cup? What is an orange? Which is pretty important for this task because it's trying to find where the oranges are. So you can see where this is going. Machine learning is not circumventing human knowledge. It's capturing human knowledge and making it more scalable so all of us get more insights in a quicker way. But with any other type of teaching, just like you teach a person, you have to make sure that the lessons learned are actually being applied correctly. All right, let's get into some examples. So when you have ontologies feeding a knowledge graph, by the way, I have a whole video on the difference between ontologies and knowledge graphs. When you are using that knowledge graph to then do question and answer, so let's take the example, I have taught the machine that all US states have capitals. And then if I populate all the US capitals and all of the, the US capital cities, if I ask the question, 
what is the capital of Pennsylvania, it will know that Pennsylvania is a U.S. state. It will then know U.S. states have capitals, and so it will look at the value of what is the capital of Pennsylvania. That's essentially all Google is doing here, and you can do it too. It's actually not too difficult. Just make sure if you do get into any kind of ontology or knowledge graph project that you scope it to a small enough question that you're trying to answer so that you can get value out of it quickly and see if it's right for you. You can also do smart recommendations. So this is what Amazon uses. So if you were using this in your library, if somebody is reading A Tale of Two Cities, if in your ontology or your knowledge graph, you have the author as the trigger for a recommendation, you know that from working with your users and with the behaviors of people using your systems. That way, if somebody is looking for something similar to A Tale of Two Cities, you would only have to go and find something that has the author, Charles Dickens. And then you would have all the other books that are about Charles Dickens. And basically what you're doing with that is you are taking the metadata and you are showing how these things are related to one another so that when that recommendation is given to the user, you dictate what is it that should be the highest value in recommending something. So here, Amazon is saying that I'm looking at some kind of drinking fountain for my pet. And here it's looking for anything. So they're using subjects here and the subject similarity to basically look at all of the different types of pet watering stations. So you can see there's things here for dogs and birds as well. So it's not using cats as, as it's, it's trigger, it's actually just using the water bowl itself. So here's one, the internet of things. So there are big data applications as well. So this one is showing how it can be used for crime investigation, but there's also the internet of library things, the internet of school things. These are massive data sets that you can then use to triangulate things that are going on in your own community. So if you are using weather data and maybe you are using um, the farmer's almanac data, you can pinpoint when there's going to be floods in your local area. Maybe that's something that's useful to your user group. If this is something that you are dealing with in a supply chain, right? If you're doing something in the manufacturing space, being able to find the criteria that would help you pinpoint when something is going to go wrong, or if you're working with cybersecurity, these are very common use cases for using a knowledge graph. Again, I have a whole video on a whole lot more examples of this. All right, so knowledge search rather than an information search. So this one I really like a lot. So if a doctor was able to ask questions out loud as they were going through their prep for different patients, what is the effect of oxycodone on a patient also taking adabiterone? Well, that's an easy one actually to know because machines can basically go through all of the medication uh, literature, all of the literature out there, on these two drugs and synthesize what it has found. So a human could have also done that if a human had the, had the time to go through and read every single article and be able to crunch all of that information and synthesize it into this one statement. That's what machines do really well. And as the information professional on the back end, it's your job to help the machine understand and make sense of what it's looking at and what it should be looking at. Because again, machines are not smart on their own. They are smart with human intervention to understand what they should be looking at and what they're getting right and what they're getting wrong. So in this case, you're looking for knowledge. What is the interaction between these two drugs rather than just an information search where you would have to search on oxycodone and then you'd have to search on the other drug and then you would have to read through all the results to try to find the answer to your question. So being able to serve up the knowledge is quite useful. This also leads into smart search. So this is mapping terminology. This I think is one of the most popular ones in the library space where you can map all of the synonyms together. So here you can see the IEEE term, which is magnetic levitation. You can see the LCSH term, which is electromagnetic suspension. And you can also see the natural language word Natural language is what you and I or the engineers would use to do a search, which is high-speed train. 
So if you did not have smart searching on the back end, if you haven't mapped all of those terms together into one concept, you would not be able to do a pretty thorough search in your own index because it would be looking for that string of characters. You can see all of the strings of characters here are very different. And if I only typed in Meglev, and that is the um, access point that I'm using, the way that I would search for something, I may or may not get things on these topics. But if you as a information professional take that leap for them and make those connections on the back end, your typical user doesn't need to see that. They just know that they got the right search and the right content that they needed, which is pretty important. So you can also do semantic enrichment. So about 76% of publishers are already using some form of semantic enrichment. And this is adding more to your content, adding more to your data. So here you can see that the machine knows to go in and when it sees a certain drug, it will go and find the drug record and then populate that into a hyperlink. So as you are going through and as a person reading this article, if you wanted to find more out about this specific drug, or if you're in chemistry, a specific compound, um, or if you are uh, in Forbes, and I think they actually do this, they have the uh, stock market, market ticket numbers. All of those things can be inserted with semantic enrichment. Again, if you have your vocabularies set up to point to certain things, that's where the machine can say, ah, I found the trigger word, which is this compound or this drug, and I can find that in my vocabulary. What did my really smart information professionals tell me to do when I found this? And that's where your work and the machine learning come into play. Okay, better search and retrieval. So this is SEO, search engine optimization. So this is something else that machines can help you with is machines know best how machines work. And ultimately a search engine is just another machine looking at an index. So you can actually use the machine to go through and highlight certain um, parts of speech and things that might actually find confusing to a search engine. So does that mean that you ask your human authors to completely change the way they're writing? Absolutely not. They are experts. They know the proper terminology for things. But things that they might not realize is really what this is highlighting. So they are suggestions. So here you can see that nothing in this document should be considered. Blah, blah, blah nothing in this document. Unless you teach the machine what to do with a negative statement. For instance, this article is not about cancer representation. Okay, well, it's going to find cancer representation. And if you're not, if your search isn't smart enough, it's going to still show up for a search on cancer representation. It doesn't understand the not. So it's very simple things like that, that machines can help you understand how would a machine interpret what is being written? And within reason, you can change it slightly to get better search engine optimization. Okay, here's another one that's very near and dear to librarians. Connecting author data. So you can see that ACM had a pilot going on for a while where they were looking at the sphere of influence. So this is very popular in scholarly graphs. There's quite a few of them out there. There's a very good librarian named Erin Tay that has a whole article on this, if you wanna go check that out. And this is talking about how authors interact with one another and who influenced who when they were actually doing their research or who do they often co-author with. When they co-authored with this other person, did they get more citations or less citations? These are things that are really helpful for authors to understand as well. Also connecting the actual article. So the last example was talking about the metadata on the article itself, which author influenced another author or which author um, co-authored with somebody from a different university, that sort of thing. This one is talking about the article itself, which citations were used in that article and how many citations did that article show up in after it was published. So. This is one of my articles, and I was actually pretty excited um, that this uh, connected papers, by the way, this is free. You can go check that out yourself. I was really interested to see what they, they had to say about my article. It has three citations, and it has 35 references. That's actually in the article. And you can see how 
it over the years has influenced other things. And that's pretty cool. If you wanna go and find some seminal article for your discipline or for the discipline of your users, this is a really cool way to see what was the impact of that research. Okay, going more into the publishing side and, and DAM, digital asset management side, um, machines can also help you fix uncommon layouts in, in your actual um, information. So these are zoning algorithms. These are going a little bit outside of the terminology focused things that we've already gone through. This one, you would still want to think about this, but before you get to your vocabulary. So this is really fixing the um, full text issues if you wanna do this in practice. So when a machine sees something that is as busy as this newspaper article, it's not really going to know what to do unless it has really good XML. If your university, if your institution is not using XML yet, please try to do so. Or HTML, something that is very structured, something more than OCR, because an OCR of this is not going to be very good for machines. So you can see there's three different ads, there's a whole full story, there's another half of a story. There's a lot of things going on here. There is something called uh, BERT and Ernie. These are machine learning tools that you can actually use to parse these different elements out of your full text. Why might you be interested in that for terminology? Because you might wanna add subject uh, metadata to all of these, either with machine learning or on your own, being able to segment these out to do so is very important. Language tags. This is something else that machines are pretty good at understanding is understanding which language is being spoken. So a lot of material actually comes with multiple languages in inside of it. If you are aggregating information, or maybe you're getting information from um, different journals, or maybe you're getting more information from the web, you need to be able to parse out the different languages. Understanding this for any kind of vocabulary is also important because if I had the word baguette and I didn't have any other context, how would you know if I meant baguette in English or baguette in French? There's a lot of borrowed words throughout a lot of different languages. Having something that actually goes in and looks at the language and the context is going to help you a lot, as well as multi-column. This is going again back to how can machines actually read your content to help you with any of these machine learning tasks. Author affiliations. This is something that I think we all struggle with is here the authors are on one line and the affiliations are on another. In the metadata behind the scenes, these could be connected or they maybe are not connected. Understanding for some of those graphical representations we saw earlier, understanding the impact of an article, being able to understand which author and which, which affiliation is incredibly important for that, especially if you are working with your own institution, understanding how your R&D projects, if they are being published, what kind of impact they're having. You might wanna know if the, if the authors were publishing under your institution or maybe their um, academic institution if they are working at both. Subject disambiguation. I think this one is near and dear to all of us. So here, one of the keyword tags, now these are keywords, understood, um, is diet. But what kind of diet? Diet actually has a lot of different examples of, of context. So if you were trying to use keywords to do something with your vocabulary, whether add these as natural language topics, it's a good idea to do, uh, or actually just using it to uh, disambiguate the subjects that you already have if you didn't know how previous indexers were using these terms, you really need to understand that context. Machines are really good at helping you do that. You first have to give it lots of training material to understand the difference between one version of diet and another, but ultimately once it understands, and that's where you have to test it, it can really help you with that disambiguation. All right, and with that, I wanna thank you very much for joining me at this SLA 2020 presentation. And here again is all of my contact information. I do teach quite a bit on this, so if you are interested, let me know or go and check out some of the resources I have here. So thank you again and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.